I was a perfectionist. I am a perfectionist. Mm-hmm. Now I'm not. I don't make perfect knives. No one does. But to the best of my capability, right. if I see a scratch or something that I could fix, I have to fix it. It has to be right. But there are flaws, and the flaws are usually like, oh, that's the best I could grind at, or it's uh, the best I could finish that, or if I know if I work if I work harder at that hand sand, it's just going to get worse because it's going to be overworked, uh, mm-hmm. things like that. But if I made it to the best of my abilities, it, that that's what I try to do. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Well, hello, Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 102 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the show. The Knife Junkie Podcast is the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn everything about knives and knife collecting, and we get to hear from the knife designers, the makers, the manufacturers, the reviewers, anybody who loves knives. The Knife Junkie Podcast is for you, and a great guest that we're going to hear from today, Bob. But first, we have a couple of special announcements uh, we talked about last week on our episode number 100. A mm-hmm. couple of special things. You were going to be doing a knife giveaway in celebration of that 100th episode. That's right. Anyone who has listened to this show or seen any of the videos knows that I'm a huge fan of the Cold Steel Broken Skull for its slender, long-bladed, super steely uh you know, you can have it on you at all times. It's so it's so feather light and thin. So I decided uh, what better knife to give away than a broken skull? Uh, as you know, I like to carry pink broken skull for cognitive dissonance, but in this case, I'm not going to force anyone to carry pink. Uh, so I got an OD green broken skull, and I'm going to add the Snaggletooth MF to it. Now, the Snaggletooth MF is the uh, aftermarket pocket deployer from Snaggletooth Tactical, a great uh, New Jersey company. And this thing allows you to uh, basically wave uh, knives out of your pocket, if you will, uh, a bit like an Ernest Emerson, uh, uh, an Emerson wave knife. Hmm. So uh, it's a great aftermarket product. It's a great American company. And of course, Cold Steel. You know how I feel about them. So uh, we asked people to email me with uh, episode 100 or 100th episode in the subject line, Mm -hmm. and they would immediately be entered into a, a random drawing. That's right. And so we're going to do that random drawing oh. right now, Jim. Oh, wow. Okay. So yeah. you're actually going to do the drawing. I, yeah. I, okay. I thought you might have had the winner already picked, but oh, this no, is no, exciting. No, no, no. We're, we're going to do it right here. Now, I'm oh, doing this. Uh, I've done this before at random.org. Mm-hmm. Uh, true random numbering. Now, these people really take randomness seriously. It's kind of a <laughs> scientific thing for them. So I decided why not, uh, why not put them in. And so I have a list of 27 entrants. So as every email came in, you assigned it a number. I assigned it. I, I would uh, shuffle it off to a different uh, folder. And, and I even checked uh, I checked the YouTube comments, too, just in case. Okay. And uh, put them in a list. And uh, as they came in, that's a, it's a chronological list. And so now I have uh, in the true number generator, I have 1 through 27. I'm going to hit generate. It's going to give I me sh- a number. I should have a dr- drum roll sound effect. <laughs> I forgot. Here we go, and number 13, and number Number, 13 is... lucky 13. Number 13 is Ben Scherer. Oh, Ben. Ben Scherer. Congratulations, Uh, Ben. So, sir, uh, Ben, if you are listening, uh, you won the Cold Steel Broken Skull uh, with the Snaggletooth MF attachment. I will be sending that out to you post-haste. Things are a little slow right now, but uh, as they ship, they ship pretty quickly. So is, uh, you know, with not too many people sending packages right now, so I will get myself in a situation where I can get to the post office ASAP Mm -hmm. and get this out to you. Because right. you don't want to wait, Ben Sharer. Uh, cool. So I will also send you an email, let you know. You nice. Want. Congratulations, Ben. Thanks, buddy, for uh, for being a listener and uh, on the Knife Junkie podcast and for entering the uh, 100th episode knife giveaway. And uh, thanks to everybody else that did enter. And uh, sorry you weren't the winner, but you are a winner because you're listening to the podcast. So <laughs> <laughs> I tend to agree, Jim. A nice second place for you. No, anyway. <laughs> But, uh, hey, if you entered, didn't enter, we also want to make sure that you join us this coming Saturday. Now, this podcast is coming out on Easter Sunday, April the 12th. This coming Saturday, April 18th at noon, the Knife Junkie is going to have a live Saturday knife 
Hangout starting at noon on his YouTube channel, and you've already got several uh, big name guests already lined up, and you're working on getting more guests. That's right. But also giving our listeners a chance to join in if they have a webcam, they can actually join in the show, talk to you, talk to the guest, show off a knife, maybe that they want to sell or whatever. It's just going to be a, a fun afternoon, and however yeah. long it goes, it's however long it goes. Well, I just want to tell people this is a great idea that Jim had because we were thank talking. Thank you, thank you, thank no, you. Uh, quite right. <laughs> uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, things we can do instead of, well, knife events that are being canceled left right. and right. And we thought what a great idea to get some of our uh, friends of the show together, uh, people who come on Thursday Night Knives and people who we've interviewed here on the show, and just kind of have a knife hangout, you know, and have it have it last I don't want to say indefinitely, but, you know, right. we'll, we'll go for as long as it goes. I, I might have lunch here, you know, while we're talking. Who knows if right. it goes for three hours? And uh, I'm trying to wrangle uh, a very special guest or two. And uh, um, we'll, we'll see if that happens. I don't know. But it would be cool to, to float someone in that everybody knows, you know, of and... And, uh, and well, hopefully we can float many people in. Yes, you know, exactly. you know we're, we're really hoping that this can be a... Uh, like I said, a, a chance for a lot of folks in the knife community to come together and uh, just chat, you know, yeah. maybe have a, a, a few interviews, as you said, during the course of the show, get, get a chance to meet different folks, have listeners or viewers come in, show off some of their knives, sell a knife, whatever. So, yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. Every, everyone has to show up. I'm going to have everything around me. All of my knives are arrayed around me, just in case something has to be pulled up. And a porta potty so you can keep going. So you <laughs> yeah, can <exactly>. keep going. <laughs> Yeah, one, right. one promise. This won't be 24 hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There will be no bedpans involved. That's right. <laughs> All right. So again, this Saturday, this coming Saturday, April 18th at noon, that's on the Knife Junkies YouTube channel that you can find at the knifejunkie.com slash YouTube. If you are not yet subscribed, please go there and subscribe now so you'll get a notification when he goes live on Saturday. But also this Thursday and pretty much every Thursday as uh, the Knife Junkie goes live with Thursday Night Knives. And that's at 10 p.m. on Thursday. So a couple of chances this week alone to uh, catch you on video as well as the Wednesday audio podcast. So that's Knife right. Junkie all around this week. Oh, yeah, yeah. Spread it, spread it thick. <laughs> All right. Well, we mentioned a very special uh, guest interview that we always do on Sunday. And a uh, fascinating interview, Bob, I thought from... Yeah. A knife maker that started as a teenager. I didn't even know what I was doing in high school at teenager, but this guy started a knife business as a teen. Yeah, yeah and not just not just uh, fussing around, messing around in the basement with knives. He started a legit business uh, at a very early age. I, I, I spoke with Nick Chuprin today of NCC Knives. Fascinating guy, uh, great story, and uh, you know, it, for me, inspirational. I love to hear how people take their passion and really, really turn it into their life. And uh, Nick most certainly did that. But also, his I, I, I admire his knives so greatly. I. I do not own one, but they are uh, so beautiful and precise, and uh, and his whole his whole approach is is uh, is pretty interesting. And another thing is he's in New York City, and you know knives in New York City are like oil and water, and so it's just very interesting to talk to someone who lives in a place that is so inhospitable to knives in general, and, and to hear how he has a flourishing business there. Pretty mm -hmm. interesting. And it's so expensive just, A, to live there and, as he mentioned, yeah. to have, you know, retail space or warehouse space or whatever in New York, you know. Yeah. It's like, wow. I think one of the first questions I ask him is, what's it like being a knife maker in New York? And his answer is hilarious. So, right. You know, you'll, you'll hear that right up front. You'll hear that and we'll get into that right now here on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Do you carry multiple knives, then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. Well, I'm here with Nick Chuprin of NCC Knives. Nick, thanks for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. No problem. Grateful. So NCC Knives, uh, we were saying right before we started rolling, um, your work first came onto my radar a couple of years back when Dr. Frunky got a uh, collaboration knife of yours. And then I started to see knives uh, straight from your shop, just you, uh, from I think Birdshot IV it was the first time I saw your knives. And um, you are a New York City knife maker, which uh, which is a strange thing. Tell me what it's like to work and live in New York City, but have your life be about knives. Uh, gotcha. Uh, two words. Uh, illegal and expensive, I guess. 
uh, legal to carry, not actually legal to make out here. Right. Um, like I said, living, it's expensive being a knife maker in New York. Commercial warehouse spacing is very expensive. Uh, so expensive. And in fact, when I went, first went full time at 17 years old, uh, six or eight, uh, six or seven years ago, I actually left New York. I came home from school one day, uh, my first semester in college. I told my parents, I'm finishing the semester next week and I'm moving out. I ended up moving to New Jersey and ended up working alongside the guys over at New Jersey Steel Baron, hmm. uh, renting warehouse space from them, uh, even even roomating one of the owners of New Jersey Steel Baron. And I did that for about two years until I was able to afford living back in New York. And I moved back here and I've been over here about three years now. It was that much cheaper to have a warehouse and apartment out there than than just a shop out here. So, what was it that brought you back to New York? Was it that uh, it's home? Uh, home and family. Okay. It is a, a particularly stimulating environment. Uh, I lived there for about 12 years of my 30s and uh, late 20s. And uh, wow, what a, what a place to be. But now, now that I look back on it, I was so cavalier about walking around with knives. I mean, uh, I guess it was pre-stop and frisk, but still, you know, it was it was kind of a sketchy thing to do, but I was very very bold about it and uh and now i'm just glad i never got pinched you know yeah and i know exactly i mean the laws are a little nicer now that they disbanded the gravity knife law Mm -hmm. yeah still all kind of bullshit uh just because the cops here aren't very well well informed um they some of them still think this is actual law it's not uh what they call the four finger policy and if you're familiar with that uh, a lot of people, a lot of people that I just know regularly that ask me, they all think this is a law. I don't understand how this came to be. Uh, the knife can't be longer than the four, you know, the span of your four fingers side by side, which makes no sense because everyone has different size, size hands. <laughs> yeah. I could carry a knife that's almost three and a half inches long, where someone else could carry a knife that's three inches, where the actual law is four inches. And now that they've disbanded the gravity knife law, uh, the only thing that's really an issue is clips now. Really? So if you, if it's if it's visible. It's it's a problem. If it's invisible, go about your business. Essentially, yeah, but I, I still think it's sketchy just because there's like some weird law about it being scary, I guess, in, in different <laughs> in different wording. Uh, if the cop thinks it's – like my knives are compound ground tantos, right. they'd probably be scary. That's a, It's a weird one. Uh, I don't think they'll enforce that, but I still – I tell most people carry something like a Swiss Army knife, something gentle, uh, something that doesn't look too frightening, something that's smaller. I still carry whatever. I travel pretty much and work the car, and I, thankfully I have friends in the police force, and I'm a knife maker. Make sure I carry my business cards, right. show show my my Instagram, and hopefully I'll get away with it. Sounds legit. We we've had uh, Doug Ritter on the show, and he said he always says just just keep it quiet and call me. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much what he tells me as well. <laughs> so uh, you started making knives full time at 17. You say yes. Wow. Uh, okay. Explain that. Describe your whole uh, your whole coming of age as a knife maker at seventeen. Um, so it started, it started earlier. Actually, I started collecting knives uh, at thirteen, uh, and not like usually the story is. Someone's like, "Oh, I saw this knife at a flea market." No, I went full custom. <laughs> my my first my first knife was pretty much. Oh no, my first knife was a Spyderco Tenacious that I still have. The second knife was a Sebenza. Oh my god! So it just kind of went <laughs> boom. Uh, it would happen over like two weeks. I bought a tenacious kind of into knives, not really, but then someone told me about a custom knife show. I was mainly into handmade items. I liked working on my hands as much as I can. And I went to that New York show, had about 15 minutes there. Uh, my brother took me there and he wanted to leave as soon as I did one lap. And I said, I'll be back here next year. And that whole year I was deciding between a Sabenza and a Strider. Got there the next year, got a Sabenza and I actually won three hinders. R.J. Martin, Anzo. I, I did really good on Lottos. Again, wow. 14 years wait, wait. Old. You're, you're telling me you won all of those? Yeah, at the Lottos. Oh, now, at, that t- at this time, I don't know how long you've been collecting for, Bob, but a hinder was about $1,000 on the second there at that time. Right. Yeah. So I walked out of that show, ended up flipping all those knives, Man. making about four grand in profit after selling all those, Ooh. and that was the start of my shop. I went right into making. Uh, I built a shop in the, in the basement of my apartment building. My landlord gave me essentially a four by four foot table, and everything that fit on that table was my shop, aside from the compressor and sandblast cabinet that was off to the side. Uh, I was kind of messing around with fixed blades. I, I, I'll tell you, for the, in that year, 
I made maybe two fixed blades and ground about 300. I never really finished them. I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to actually make handles and finish them until the grind was right. Uh, but during that time, I was making uh, bullet beads. Mm-hmm. And I haven't shown those in years. But that was essentially what I that, – that was my business plan is make these bullet beads. Back then, beads were pretty hot. You mean good. for lanyards? For, yes. Uh, yeah, okay. Essentially, they were clone 8, 380 ACP and 45 ACP. Eventually, I made 9 millimeter in various brass, copper, titanium, zirconium, various materials. Uh, and dealers love them. Uh, dealers are picking them up insanely well. Uh, so, uh, honestly, I was making about – I made about five figures that year in just beads. That, mm, that, that'll nice. just show you where the bead market was back then. Right. Uh, at 14 years old, I was like, wow, this is amazing. And I just kind of still did it as a hobby and all well, throughout high school. I never really talked about it because you don't want to be that weird kid that dealt with knives in high school, especially in New mm-hmm. York City. Yeah. But that all that money literally just helped me build my shop as I was learning the market and stayed very in, in touch with the market. Kind of was a somewhat of a dealer. Went to a lot of shows, stayed on top of the forums, trying to buy and resell what I understood had a secondary. And just put put that money back into building a shop slash collecting. I was still a collector. I collected about six customs at a time, whatever mm-hmm. filled to, fill, fit in my case. And anytime I wanted something else, I would just sell something and put it back into the case. It's very disciplined of you, sir. I, I applaud you. Well, that, that was just the way I was able to invest back in the shop. If I kept too many, I wouldn't be able to reinvest into right, the shop. Right. Unfortunately, uh, right before, I guess, 16, before I went full time, I lost the shop to Hurricane Sandy. Oh, no. I'm right there in that little long part in the center of Brooklyn, uh-huh. and I'm, my building is right on the coast. Uh, so I lost this higher shop. I was pretty uh, distraught, let's say, and I was like, okay, well, that's the end of that, I guess. And I got lucky again at the New York Custom Life show with a couple lottos and got about two grand out of that. I was like, you know what? Let, let's start to build again. And again, I wasn't making any money making knives then. I was just doing it for fun and I wasn't really making a folder. At that time, I was about to start my first folder. The first folder was half done, then Sandy destroyed it. Mm. Uh, but I was making good money making the beads. And thankfully, that kept me encouraged to stay in this. If I wasn't making beads or they weren't sewn, Sandy would have probably been the end of my knife career. Uh, thankfully, the beads were keeping me motivated to do this, and I was still into collecting. I get into high school. I mean, I get out of high school, and at this time, I'm already making folders. I think I brought my first folder to bleach my first blade show, which was uh, 2020. I guess that'll be 2014. Mm-hmm. And that was my first folder, my first hollow grind, my first compound grind. I kind of went all out on it. Wow. And uh, that was last year of high school. So I was 2013 or 20, that was 2014, I guess. And I brought it to blade show. Everyone loved it. Every knife maker is like, oh, this is great. But I could tell they're just being nice to the kid. It's horrible. And that's when I got to college on the weekend. I really didn't like school. I was in there for engineering. Just wanted to work with my hands, kind of talk to some engineers while I was in there doing an apprenticeship. And I realized that and even mechanical engineering, what I wanted to be in for is a desk job for the first 10 years. Oh. And I had no motivations of doing a desk job. So I came home, literally told my parents that day. I was like, look, I have a, everything's lined up. I'm going to try this for a year. I was ahead. Uh, my college credits were ahead of a year. The normal kids my age because of my high school credits. So I was like, I'm going to do this for a year. They were like hesitant. But I was like, look, I'm out next week. I have a plan. I have. I had a pre-order that was going to last me about six months. So I was like, I'm going to go try this. And but it's uh, about six years now, seven, six years now, and I'm still doing it with a 2,000 square foot shop here in New York. That's amazing. So so describe the shop you're in now and and uh, and what you had to do to get to a point where you were able to move into a you know, better space. Well, as I mentioned, when I went full time. I, I had to leave New York. Essentially, I had to. And in New York, it's pretty normal to live at home till about till you're about twenty five. Uh, usually, you don't move out until about t- like my brother was at home till he was twenty seven because he was in college. Mm-hmm. It just it's not normal. Uh, like I said, I left left that left in New Jersey. Thankfully, the NJ Steel Bear guys were nice enough to take me in there. Uh, we pretty much had no life from seventeen to twenty. As I lived there, Monday to Saturday, Monday to Friday, Monday to Saturday, I worked my ass off, made knives, and then on the weekends, I would come home and stay with the parents in, in New York, and that's pretty much when I went out. But for about those three years, uh, I dedicated my life to making sure that I could have built enough of a following and money to make sure this could be a viable career. Right. So, you have a, a new shop. It's not new to you now, but it's, uh, you know. It's about three, uh, three, November was three years. So are you producing all of these knives on your own right now? 
Uh, no. So my father has been full time with me for the last seven, eight months now. So it's it's been me and my father. Besides that, I was always myself. I mean, okay. he he would work like a Saturday once in a while if I needed like if I was doing some job shop work. And for the people I don't understand, I, I produce parts for other makers sometimes. Oh, okay. Because I have a uh, CNC capabilities. And sometimes it'll be a lot of parts that have to be sandblasted or something like that that I just don't want to do and it doesn't sound like skilled labor. Uh-huh. So my dad will come in every every couple Saturdays or something like that and take care of those kind of tasks. And he got fired, I guess, mentioned six, seven months, eight months ago, about eight months ago, I think. And I was like, honestly, like I'm really busy right now. Can you afford to try this for a few months before you go for a new job? And he said, yes. Wow. And eight months and we're still going. I got to say, that's pretty amazing to be able to offer – that to your father when you know he's been doing that for you your whole life and you can turn around and offer him that that's pretty amazing well i've had apprentices in the past uh, i'm not gonna name names but unfortunately when you teach someone how to do this in new york it was a little easier but the apprentices were out of jersey if they have any garage space at all and they see my they see my market they see my sales they see how to do it they see how they could start mm. uh they they kind of go off and do it themselves Right. Fortunately, it was not something I was able to do. As I mentioned, I was a kid. Commercial space is insanely expensive. I probably have one of the most expensive shops in our entire community. I pay more for my shop than I do for my rent, and that's not cheap. Yeah, they, it's just not easy to do in New York. And also, there's no skilled labor in New York. My dad was good with his hands. I was like, well, honestly, let's go and give it a try. And he's been so far so good. That's Aside cool. from the downfalls of working with your father, right? Because you <laughs> got to tell him what to do. <laughs> it's yeah. It's uh. When you work with him and then I, I live at home just because there's no – just for ease since we carpool and I'm always at work. Right. Plus, I live in a nice neighborhood in Brooklyn. Then a series and move. So, it's it's a weird dynamic. He's with me eight hours a day at the work to 12 hours a day depending on the day. And then when we're free, it's at home. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the uh, dynamic reverses, I would imagine. Mm-hmm. So, you, you said before that uh, when you were first starting out and you were grinding, uh, you were making a bunch of fixed blades kind of working on – getting your attributes as a grinder down. You said that you, you couldn't bring yourself to bring, to put handles onto a uh, a blade that wasn't ground perfectly. Where do you think that instinct came from? Why not just get a knife out there that was imperfect? Uh, I, I just couldn't. I was I'm, I was a perfectionist. I am a perfectionist. Mm-hmm. No, I'm not, I don't make perfect knives. No one does. But to the best of my capability. If I see a scratch or something that I could fix, I have to fix it. It has to be right. But there are flaws, and the flaws are usually like, oh, that's the best I could grind at. Or it's uh, the best I could finish that. Or if I know if I work if I work harder at the hand sand, it's just going to get worse because it's going to be overworked. Uh, mm-hmm. Things like that. But if I made it to the best of my abilities, it, that that's what I try to do. Yeah, at least in that case, it, it was to the best of my abilities – but not to what I consider a sellable ability because I was trying to make some money to expand my shop. And I was like, well, if I made this, I would not buy this for $150, mm-hmm. which was the going rate for a fixed weight of that style back then. I always looked at it like that because I was a collector. If I didn't think I would buy it, I couldn't sell it. Uh, same thing like I mentioned with my first three folders. I did never – I had the first one. Uh, the second and third one I eventually did sell to, cl- like to, to what I consider friend collectors that were local that just wanted it. Uh, but the first one's still in my possession. It was It's never going to go anywhere. Unfortunately, the second one did sell. The guy stopped collecting, and I don't. I saw it on Arizona once. Oh. Arizona Custom Knives, that is, and it's kind of gone again. It's when it's one of those knives that kind of go, go into a safe and never pop up again. Right. So, if you were to describe your style or uh, describe uh, the, the the things that you look to uh, imbue your knives with stylistically, what are they? Modern, sharp. Art Deco, I guess. I don't really have organic designs, mm-hmm. uh, and that's for a reason. I don't. I don't really like really curvy organic designs. I really like straight linear lines. That's why the MK1 is a straight line. There's a few arcs to it, but it, it, the pivot tip to to butt pivot everything's a straight line. The knife opens 180 degrees. That was the point of that knife. I wanted it to be really straight. And my other designs that I do have are kind of like that. Um, but that was that was that's just my design philosophy. Design philosophy. Some people like really organic mm-hmm. and really curvy, and that's not my thing. Same thing. But when, now that I do CNC, the type of milling I do is a lot different. But when I did everything by hand, everything was chamfers. I really like big chamfers and various styles and forms of it. But I never really liked rounded, 
like I like contours, but it wasn't really oh how do I explain it? Uh it wasn't it was like an even contour. There's it wasn't like multifaceted contours mm-hmm. in all sorts mm-hmm. of directions. I just like very uniformity and very linear, let's say. Yeah, and, and they all look very clean to me. You know, they got that clean and then you look at the often your knives are, uh, have tanto blades beautifully yeah. ground uh swedged you know multifaceted tanto blades uh that looks like a very difficult thing to to do <laughs> to me a, yeah. a tanto i mean like this is this is speaking as someone who's who's ground 20 some odd pieces of steel into knife like objects like it's very 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 hard to do when you're not doing it every day and then uh, keep on the fact that that you are doing these incredibly complex grinds that are that are mirrored on both sides. What are, what are the challenges of that kind of uh, production, especially when you're trying to move, you know, make a number of them? Well, there's a lot of challenges to it. I take great pride in my tantos, as you see. Most of my designs have been tantos. The next three designs that I'm doing won't be, um, just because now that I work with my father, the biggest bottleneck is me grinding blades. I take a lot of time to grind those tantos. Because I, I have a very specific checklist for them. Mm-hmm. I've seen many guys do a similar Tanto. And there's a lot of knives that look like mine. But I've been making an MK1 for about eight years now. Back then, no one made that knife. That was the reason I... That's actually the reason I became a knife maker. I couldn't buy what I wanted. Oh, really? The only knives that wore that similar shape was um, Bob Lump Tanto. Couldn't mm-hmm. buy that. Southern Flippin' Tanto. Um... I did buy a Les Voorhees Mini Abram. I, it's one of the only two knives I still have in my collection. It, you, I see you thinking about it. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I hit the mic. Uh, it's a one of two. So oh, they were both wow. one-offs. And I got on his books for another Tanto, and he calls me, and he's like, hey, man, I've already scrapped three blades. I can't replicate this. Do you want something else? So I was like, oh, I was just grinding like a normal flat ground Tanto. I'm cool. I'm like a beginner knife maker. I get it. I get the knife. I didn't like it just because it wasn't ground like that. Sold mm-hmm. it unfortunately. But back then, no one did it. Uh, that was one of the few that I've seen. And uh, John Barker was getting pretty hot at that time. He did it. But I couldn't get one of those either because I wasn't going to pay four grand and I wasn't. Ha- I didn't have any luck with my lottos. That, like, yeah, that was nice money if I wanted it, but well, I really would have wanted it if I wanted to keep it. Right. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to try to figure it out myself. Now, everyone and their mother does it. There's many makers. I always say if I became a knife maker today, I would. I mean, I wouldn't become a knife maker just because I could buy a Chinese Riot that does it great. Hmm. Well, okay. Wait, you you saying now everybody does it? Do you mean everybody makes uh, the the complex hollow ground Tanto harpoon? Like are you yes. saying like okay? There's a lot of great talent out there these days. There's a lot more information and a lot more people jumping into this that have prior talents. Interesting. You mean like uh, how half the people I seem to talk to. Uh, we're in the aerospace industry or, or yes. yeah. Usually Machining. back then a guy who came in that showed their first knife was like, yeah, it's great. It's he treated it cuts. Yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't look great. Uh, now those guys, Oh, it's my second knife. I'm like, wow, that's really good. So you at some point got a CNC machine. Presumably that is to, uh, up your production, but also, um, uh, what's the word I'm trying to? Uh, it, it was more of uh, career reliability. It, no, it was more about career reliability. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I was in school for uh, mechanical engineering, so I was already I had a mindset about making money and being business like viable a viable career. Mm-hmm. Also, I've always been a hustler and business minded. I've been making money since I was 10 years old to various business ventures. So, in my head, I was like, oh, this is great. I found a career that I could work on my hands as long as make some money. And obviously, I'm surviving here in New York. So, I'm making it work. Yeah. I got the CNC because I walked in. Uh, at Brian Nadal, Sharp by Design, he used to come to NJ Steel Baron all the time. And I got fr- I became friends with him over the years. And he invited me over to his shop. And I go to his house. I check out the CNC, check out his operation. And his operation is out of one-car garage. Amazing. I'm used to working out of a shop, fully equipped. Now, that only works because he doesn't grind his own blades. He doesn't mm-hmm. have a grinder, but he makes it work. Uh, now, like looking compared to my facility, like I said, I have 2,000 square feet, but I'm only using eight, eight to 900 square feet. Mm-hmm. It's just the space that I have is equivalent. I would have anywhere else I'd pay for eight or 900 square feet. It's what I needed. It just that, that place came up. It was a mess. I just put work into it since I'm very handy. I built, I fixed the roof, did the plumbing, did the electric, built new walls. 
So I fixed it up and just the rent makes sense to have the space as I need it. I grow. But I walked in there and I walk out and I'm like, yeah, this is, I was still in Jersey. So I was probably 19 years old. I've had the CNC for four and a half years. So yeah, I'd say 19 years old. And I walked out of there. I get in my car. It's about an hour drive home. And it gets me thinking. I was like, you know, if I'm serious about making this a full-time career, that is the next step. Mm -hmm. I, I, either I go CNC or I don't do this because I can't grind knives my whole life by hand. 19, like I said, if the, I was ready to make this full-time career, I dropped out of school. I had at least 40 years ahead of me doing this. And I had to figure it out. And I, I was thinking about every time I'm sick, I, I couldn't work. Every time I had back problems, like I, I, I used to be very severely overweight at that time and I had chronic back problems. So every time my back would go out, I couldn't work. I couldn't get paid. Uh, so I was like, you know what? I'll, I have to figure this out. I have to get a CNC. How much is it? Okay, I need 30 grand. Let's figure this out. How do I make this work? Uh, it's complex. You need degrees for it. You need to take classes. I was like, you know what? I'm young. I've always taught myself how to do everything I do. Brian kind of helped me a little bit along the way. I gave myself a year to get it. I spent about an hour or two every night after work reading, studying. Thankfully, CNC is 80% in the program. So it's stuff that mm. I could do without buying a machine. Mm. I did all the programming up to, up to the point where I had the knife designed, the fixture designed, which is known as CAD. CAD is the 3D modeling of the part. CAM is the G code that is generated from the, the model that the machine reads. Wait, wait, say that again. I'm sorry. So CAD is the 3D modeling of the part. Got it. That is the aesthetical 3D dimension of the physical item. CAM is what the machine reads. Oh, so okay. you generate G code and the machine reads that and you use the model to generate the CAM. Right. So you're able to do all that without even owning a machine. That's the nice part about CNC. And I tell everyone, it doesn't matter what machine you buy, 80% is in the computer. You can learn, like, like, for example, Rob, when he was looking into CNC, I was teaching him. And I was like, look, you don't need to buy a machine. You don't have to rush into this. Get the program. Just sit there in your free time and just mess around with it. By the time I had a machine, I had to finish knife off that machine within the week because I had the fixtures designed. I had the knives designed. I had the cam designed. I had the tooling that I was going to use. Everything was pre-planned out to get the thing going day one. So, did you see a change in your um, creative thinking or your planning? That you know, either your left side or the right side of your brain. Did you see some sort of a change in your thought process once you got the CNC? I mean, of course, it changed your process, but I mean, did it change your creative thinking in any way? Definitely. How uh, so? As far as uh, not design wise, not blade wise, because I still hand grind all my blades. As far as handle wise, I, I, I to get introduced to the new world to me. I was very good at manual machining with being self taught. Uh, back then, a lot of guys knew me for designing fixtures. I was very good at seeing a part of designing a fixture to run manual. Now in CNC, things don't, fixtures don't really matter. You just have to mount some screws and the machine moves whichever way you want. Hmm. But in manual machining, fixtures are a big deal for repeatability and certain things. And I hadn't that many makers. Same thing with Rob. When I flew out there, like he's watching my fixture design process. Uh, I was just really good at that. And that helped me transition into CNCs. So I did a lot of unique stuff in manual machining even prior to the CNC. But it did introduce a lot more things uh, like inlays and certain machining patterns that were really hard to do hmm. with manual machining. I was like, well, this is easier and repeatable. Same thing, I don't really do the whole patterns like a lot of guys do these days because I don't have to. If I want to make it a triangle or a slot looking thing, I, I can. It's the same amount of work for the CNC. You've been doing this cool, I don't know, I, I've seen it a lot in, on your Instagram page, but this uh, sort of a grid pattern. It's like knurling. Yeah. But I call it like a prismatic grid because it tapers out the, the, the diamonds. Yes, yes. And I used to do a similar pattern manually, but it was even. It was more of instead of a frag pattern, it was like a diamond frag. And this way I could which would have been insanely hard to do manually. But with the CNC, right. I could tell it to array out in, its, in a specific degree, and that's why it gets bigger and spread out. It was a simpler pattern until I started messing with finishes. And I've, and I've finished in many unique ways because it allows for a lot of facets for different, for different sanding and tumbling processes. Right, right. And it seems like, uh, well, now having the capability of the CNC, you were able to, to get that pattern and it, it it actually enhanced your creativity because that pattern is really cool the way it the way it arrays out and and your eye is searching for regularity but it doesn't find any but you know it's got to feel good in the hand you know and mm -hmm. it's got to you know it looks good it feels good and it's a maybe it's a feature you wouldn't have before you had this you know unique yeah. capability back then I used to do more I did a lot of mill uh, mill milling on the handles but I was known for my various sculpted chamfers. Mm -hmm. 
lot of guys do 45 degree standard chamfers. Now it's a little different, but if you would, uh, best way to describe it, it was a style that I inherited from Jeff Tough Thumbs. Uh, hmm. I watched him, like the modern MK1 use that you see, it's, I guess, the Gen 4 or 5, but it's very close to the Gen 2. And the Jeff, I mean, the Gen 2 was because of Jeff Blavel. I went over to his shop and he reshaped MK1, and that's what it looks more similar to. My original MK1 is actually, like I said, not its organic stuff, but it was a little bit more organic. He made it more linear and sharp. And I kind of went out from there. Now, like I said, I'm on Gen 5 or so, but back then, he, it's closer to what the Gen 2 would have been. The only downside to CNC is it's very consistent, but it's very expensive and painstaking to make changes. Back then, my knives were more unique and different. Every time I sculpted them nowadays, uh, I still have a lot of patterns considering compared to other CNC makers for design, but it's not as many as I'd like just because of complications when doing orders. Well, are the uh, are the errors fewer and further between, though? I mean, they're, they're harder to fix, but do they happen less often? No, they happen more often because oh, usually damn. when you <laughs> did things by hand, you would have one error one time and you learn the next time. Uh, unfortunately, with CNC, the machine's only as smart as the human. Uh. So if I miss a dot or a line somewhere, I could fuck up 40 sets of handles before I realize <laughs> oh, and there goes God. thousands of dollars, which may have may or not have done in the past. Right, right. Actually, I was the first patch, batch I ever did. I've spent all the money on the CNC and I was like, okay, I'm almost broke. Let's make sure these knives work. And I made three that worked great. And then I missed a dot or a line somewhere, which means a lot because that could mean an inch or a, a, a dow. I don't remember exactly what the issue was. It was something with the bearing counterbores. And I messed up 40 sets of knives. So imagine oh. after spending all that money being ni- 18 years old, 19 years old, ready to run the CNC, still have bills to come. And I messed up 40 knives after paying for oh, titanium, steel, heat treat, water jet, everything. And then I have to start over, and I was like, well, there goes all of my savings. And I pretty much started with nothing, no money in the bank. The CNC that's just sitting there, I was like, huh, I have to run the CNC like as if I'm a manual machinist. And I was literally CNCing knives <laughs> one by one for about three months there until I really figured out every error. Painful lesson. Yeah. It was It was that thing. It's like, oh, did, I, did knives become easier to make and fix? I was like, honestly, not really. Uh, just as soon as I f- figured out every issue and every problem and how to counteract it, from being a manual knife maker, uh, I get this curveball and I go CNC. It's I felt like a novice again. It it, it as if I restarted as from scratch. The mm-hmm. issues were different. The fixes were different. It was an entirely different ball game. It's so everyone's like, oh, CNC is easy. I'm like, it's not. It's a different game. It's actually harder to be a CNC knife maker than a CNC machine. A little fresh, I'd say, if you have no knowledge of it, than the manual maker. Because, yeah, if I have a new design, I could go make a new manual one tomorrow. If I got mm-hmm. a new design, I can't make it on the CNC for three months. They'll have everything figured out. Because you have to code it. Yeah, right. You have to, have to code it. it. And, it, for example, for me to go make a knife, a brand new design, with two sheets of titanium and a piece of steel, I'll have it in there or two manually done. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it, was, it doesn't. But, like, for me to make a knife without fixtures on the CNC or do it with fixtures just to get it going, that first knife is going to cost me three grand. Mm-hmm. My cost just to, to make all the fixtures and everything, you can't just clamp, slap a piece on there. Right. So it's, it's an entirely different ballgame. I want to back up to when you went to kind of the beginning when you moved from fixed blades to folders, because this is kind of a, a similar question as to going to the CNC, uh, CNC machine. You're going from a fixed blade, which is a simple concept. You know, I'm not saying it's simple or easy to make a good fixed blade, but it's a simple concept. And then you're moving to something that's a folder that is a that is not a simple concept. It has mechanics and it has, uh, you know, it has areas where you have to be so precise. So what was that transition like going from something fixed and inert to something that is mechanical and, and always dynamic? Um, easier, I'd actually say. Huh. I'm very good with mechanics. I've actually never sold a fixed blade when I started. I, I didn't sell a fixed blade until about two years ago when I was doing kitchen knives. Uh, the, like I said, the fixed blades are hobbies. I was realizing, like, there's no money in this. And for me, like I said, it's a hobby. I'm not all about the money. But again, I've been full time for six years or so and a maker for 10. I don't, so I don't want to sound arrogant, but it's a business. I have mm-hmm. to make money. Yeah. And like I said, I was always looking for long-term, viabi- long-term viability. And I was like, well, I have to make folders. Same thing with the CNC. I walked into the shop. I walked, I was like, I have to be, a, I have to get a CNC. And I didn't mention I got the CNC in about nine months. Hmm studying and teaching myself over nine months, an hour to a night, 
The goal was a year, so I ended up getting it early because I found a deal. But uh, I just go back to saying I just didn't – the fixed plate just didn't – they didn't sell out right away, let's say. Mm-hmm. I knew I wasn't going to be a sellout maker right away, but I didn't really – back then, I didn't know any sellout fixed plate makers. Just didn't really exist. They didn't have the same clientele, the same market. Right. So I was like, you know what? I got to figure out this folder thing. Plus, they seem more interesting to me. Uh, the full fixed blades were kind of boring, and I hate it working with Kydex. Yeah, fixed fixed blades. Uh, I mean, I love I love all knives, but uh, really, a folder folding knives seems like a great place to go because everyone ca- well, not everyone carries them, but you can carry them all the time. Yeah. Whereas, you know, I'd love to be a big old nerd and walk around with my fixed blades and my swords on me all the time, but uh, you know, can't do that. But I can walk around with a pretty pretty sweet knife in my pocket. So, uh, yeah, it seems like that is the uh, a business savvy decision. You mentioned before Rob Carter. I think Rob Carter. You mentioned Rob a couple of times. I'm, uh, I'm yep. assuming Carter and Jeff Blauvel. Who are some of your mentors? Uh, I'm assuming they are. Uh, but did you have mentors or in people who influenced you as you were deciding to, to uh, shift okay. your life in this direction? Honestly, I don't want to say, like I, said, I don't want to say, I never really had a mentor. I just kind of had people that were there. Mm-hmm. Bla- uh, Jeff Blaw, that was just in the beginning. I kind of just knew Jeff because of the shows. And he was pretty close. He helped me with that first design. And me and Rob, that was a, like a week into it. That became more of a mutual relationship than this. He's a mentor to me. Mm-hmm. Um, my relationship with Rob started on USN. I asked for a question about detents when I was starting the folder venture. He just dropped off his number. He's like, call me. And wow. Seven hours later on a phone call, we were talking all the time. Now, mind you, this is a grown man. And I was like 14 years old. And he gave me the time of day to answer all my questions. So, as I got more into knife making, eventually, like I meant, like I said, I was the fixturing design and mechanical part of milling kind of just came to me. And he was just getting into machining himself. He was, he was a long maker for a long time. But he was classically trained by his father and grandfather, which were hmm. two legends. Yeah. Their processes were very different. So as soon as I got really into it, machining, that became more of a mutual relationship. Uh, he he taught me kind of the basics of how to get it going, and I taught him how to modernize his knives and modernize his processes. Uh, if you, you could, there was a day where it all changed. My knives and his, you would notice. The first time I flew off to Texas in December of whatever year, but whenever we did the MK16 project, uh, is I showed him all my machining tricks, and he showed me all his folder tricks, mainly. Why is this knife sticky? How to fix it? Why is there lock rock? How to fix it? Stuff like that. And that that week changed both of our careers for the better. And that then I just screwed. That was definitely over six years ago. It was about seven years ago, I think. Uh, yeah, that was about seven years ago. Uh, that was kind of the same thing too. I called him. Everything I do is really quick. I don't not really. I don't like to drag things out. I called him. I was like, "Yo, can I come down next week?" He's like, you "Serious?" I'm like, "Yeah." I came home with my parents again. I was like, "Okay, I'm flying to Texas for a week or two next week." <laughs> And I was in Texas a week later. Then I was culture shock because he was out <laughs> in the woods. Uh, this led to the MK16, this trip? That's the Yeah, collaborate. that was just because I have an MK1 and he has an F16. Right. And right. they were very similar design knives already. And we were like, oh, just morph them. Let's take my more of my blade style and take your handle and mix them. That, that knife, if I'm correct, has such a cool feature on the spine of the blade. It's got a harpoon, but then it's got... Between the harpoon and the jimping, it's got like this semi-circular dip into the no, top. No, that, th- that is the newer one. So oh, okay. MK16 was Apologies. essentially, it had jimping. Uh, we only made like nine of those. This was, like I said, seven years ago. Okay. Uh, it was longer. So it was off of my MK1S, I mean L, which I only made about six of those two. So three and three quarter version. It was more of my blade because uh, his, his, the ratios of his blade were a bit different. And it was literally a half and half morph of mine and his scale handle. Hmm. His F16, if you could picture it, was two. It's two big choils, I would say, or two big arcs. Uh, and but it was a little bit more organic. And then my, so I kind of just essentially he sent me his file, and I mashed mine into it and finished the design. That's how most of our collabs work. Is a lot of our design aesthetics are similar. So he would send me his file, and I would take my knife that looks similar to it, and I would do all the morphing and mashing together. Same thing, that's what the new BBM was. Uh, I, he sent me his knife, and I completely redesigned it with my aesthetics, rescaled it, redesigned my, like, the for example, the screw going through the clip and being the one screw construction, uh, the, the fuller, the, the way the hole is done. That was my aesthetic to it. We didn't make many of those. The one you're mentioning is the recent collab we did, which was uh, just my MK1, and I just kind of took that little arc at the back of the blade. 
But essentially, that was not a design collab. That was more, he flew down here, we made those together. Oh. Because it was a very sh- short notice trip. That that trip was all decided within the month. He's like, you know what? We don't have time to make more BBMs. So let's just make this MK1 RC thing. So that wasn't really a design thing. That was just, you know, come fly down and we'll grind these and make these together. So do you have other collaborative relationships like that? Is Or is that a difficult and rare kind of thing to maintain? Uh, they were easier to make when I was a manual knife maker. Mm-hmm. Being a CNC knife maker, doing new designs, like I said, they take a lot of R&D. And that was the reason we did the MK1RC is because it was all the same fixtures. The blade was, instead of a Japanese Tanto shape, it was American Tanto. Cause, uh, uh, and the little swoop thing at the back. The handle, one-to-one. My mill patterns, one-to-one. The blade is the only thing that really changed that, that knife. Uh, we made about 40 of those, but that was the point of it. It was very short notice. We, we, we lost money on the BBM project, even though it became a success. People made more money on that project than we did. So the point of the RCs, his second and third trip was to try a new process and nail it down. The second trip was great. That was the RC trip. The third trip, we were supposed to make BBMs and shit happened. I had some issues in life and I was like, yo, honestly, I don't have time to redesign the BBM for the new process and you're flying down in three weeks. There's no time for water jet heat treat. Let's just do the RCs right now. And again, and that's what we did. And the new pro, the third time he was here was the finalized version of the process. And it was great. We, in three weeks, we made 20 knives, set lock wow. and detail on 17 more. And it was, it was a profitable trip. He was happy. I was happy. We're like, cool. We're doing this again. He should, he was supposed to come back here in J- July ish. To do BBMs again. We haven't mentioned that yet, but it's not happening. So that's why I'm mentioning it. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> of the, the whole virus situation. Right, right. We are still planning on doing them this year. We just got to figure out what's the virus situation, how to get this to work. Trying to figure out how to do it remotely, or we're still trying to figure out but the virus has made that trip be canceled so far. The other collabs I've done kind of here and there with John Gray, he's a local maker. Mm. We've done about five where I'd, I'd make him, a, I'd give him a knife that's locking a D10 thing. And I machine it all out, but I don't machine the be- like the I don't machine in uh, the bevels on the handles, none of the contours, just just a brick essentially with con- with counter bores to put the screws in. I said the lock and detent. Uh, I have a very unique action, very snappy. I don't like what I uh, what I call a limp dick action. I have to let my speaker rob. If you flip, if the, if the knife breaks the detent, it's gonna open. It shouldn't half open. My knives never usually half open. At least how I open them. Right. Uh, just because flipping a knife is an art, I'd say it does take some muscle memory to figure it out. For example, my dad couldn't flip my knives open for about three months. And I can I kind of <laughs> realize I'm like, it's not, it's not something everyone could do off the bat. There's kind of a technique to it, I'd say. Uh, it's something I've also noticed that shows when I exhibit a lot of guys pick up a knife and like don't open it correctly. If you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would imagine if you, if you're used to, you know, if you're someone who opens a lot of, uh, frame locks, you're, You'll probably do all right picking up your knife because you kind of know not to grip it too tight uh, you know, over the lock and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's usually the lock thing and then also the angle that they flip them at. Uh, even me as a custom maker, I'll pick up someone's knife. I, I might fail to flip it correctly the first time, but usually mm-hmm. I'll get on the second or third. Some knives, like my knife, has what they call a trigger flip. It's straight up and down. Okay. Uh, that's because my lipper tab, and I could do that mathematically. I know how my knives are going to flip by the mathematics how I lay out the design. Uh, if it's above the, if, essentially, if the flipper tab is above the pivot, mm-hmm. it's going to be a, uh, a trigger flip. So straight down, that flips. If a knife is at the center of the pivot or under the pivot, it's going to be what they like. There's not really a name for it. It's, imagine just pushing it in towards the pivot, like a 45 degree push inwards. Right. Uh, my knives won't flip that way. The pivot's a little too high and the detent's a little too strong. It has to be a trigger pull. But that's just the way it's designed. I have different designs that are trigger, I mean, 45 degree inward pushes but as far as mk1 goes it's it's a trigger pull that's the that's the action you're looking for yeah it takes more leverage to flip them it's a little harder it's not for everyone uh i've had knives before where i've shipped them out and the guy's like i can't flip this open i'm like oh <laughs> i i can make them a detail a little lighter for you but it's not yeah. it's, my knife might not be for you and it's just honestly if i don't make a knife for everyone i was inspired for detents off of rj martin's knives and McGinnis, mcginnis's knives those are the two knives i studied when developing my detent I, I have never handled either, unfortunately, but I, I take it to have the hard, crisp detents that you can't yes. miss flip. Essentially, yeah. And that was the knives that I collected. I, like I said, I, I started making knives because I couldn't buy the knives that I wanted to. And same thing with the action. There was knives like that in those actions. I did own RJs. I did own McGinnis's. When I collected, 
Uh, but that was easier to find more than the grind was. But again, uh, I make what I like. Uh, right. I don't make a knife for everyone. I don't think anyone makes a knife for everyone unless it's a production knife. Do you carry one of your own knives? Yes, it's one that's very, it's not perfect. It was the third knife I made. Um, I need to really make myself a nice one. It's very off center. It's essentially not like a hair off center where guys are like, it, it, it's off center. It, <laughs> it, it's essentially, you can't fit a, it's not grubbing on the side of the frame, but you right. can't put a paper in between. It's, it's tight. <laughs> I asked, uh, I asked Jeff Blauvelt the same question. Do you carry your own knife? He's like, do you carry your paycheck around with you all day, all week? <laughs> and I'm like, hmm, good. I'll probably it, start saying that. That's a good one. Interesting point, man. <laughs> Because well, you figure if it's if it's good enough to sell, you got to sell it. Exactly. And if it's not good enough to sell, well, you may as well carry it around with you so you can get get the skinny on it and and know what to fix in the future. You know. Well, every time I see Jeff, he usually carries one once in a while for like a week, but then he always sells it, which I used to do back in the day too. Nowadays, I'm more I'm not as connected to the knives I make these days. Mm-hmm. It's a paycheck. It's a knife. Also, the MK1 design I've made it for so long. It's kind of. I'm really bored and over it. I, I, that knife was supposed to stop being me. It made like two years ago, but a few complications just kind of kept bringing it back. You said you're less att- attached to your knives than you once were. Is that because you've made so many of them or is that because your process has changed and and it's part machine, part handmade? Do you think that has detached you at all? No, I, I actually am more fond of CNC made knives nowadays than custom knives for one reason. A custom knife, you can't, you always tell where a knife, or knife maker messed up and how much attention he takes to the knife. Every, it's very easy to round over a sharp corner. You just take it to the scotch bread wheel. Mm. But in the CNC knives, I could always tell how diligent a maker is about setting up the CNC. Uh, it's very easy to tell if a, a, a little five dial chamfer that just to break the corner is was set up in tolerance and in spec by the evenness of the chamfer. You're not going to tell on the big chamfer, but on the inside of the handles that have a five ten dial chamfer, you, if you know what you're looking for, you'll always tell how diligent the maker is about setting them up. Now, mine aren't always perfect every time either. Uh, like I said, they're not perfect. It's not something a, co- a normal collector would notice. But there's enough of a perfect area where you can tell where it's like, oh, uh, this guy just didn't know what to look for or just doesn't care. Or his machine depends. also depends on the machine he's using. Mm-hmm. But it's just how careful he's with his fixture. Uh, for example, I always have to be due diligent that my fixture has a, a four-part stack, for example, from the table to the actual part. There's a master palette, then there's the, the, the palette, sub palette, then there's the, the actual part of the palette for the handle, and then there's the handle. If there's a chip or a burr anywhere in between those parts, those little tiny chamfers will be off. They have to, oh, if it's a little chip or if there's a scratch, because the scratch will be raised, it won't sit perfectly. You will never notice that anything big, but such a fine little chamfer mm-hmm. just to deburr something, you'll see it. It's like the the pea in the princess or the, you know, the princess who sleeps on all the mattresses but can still feel that tiny pea underneath the bottom yeah. one. You have to take a lot of due diligence. Make sure you sanded everything flush. Make sure you yeah. inspected everything. Make sure you blew it all off. And then there's guys that just kind of slap it on there and let it rip. And nothing wrong with those either. Just when I look at it, I, I could always tell when something's wrong. Like Brian that used to call me out on it all the time. When I first started, he's like, I'll be 3D machining something and it'll be like a missing line of code or – like I said, a burr or something where something is not exactly level. He'd be like, what's that extra line there? What, why is this one line squiggly or something like that? I'm like, you suck. <laughs> like, I used to call him out. I'm like, oh. So would you ever uh, send one of your designs to a Riot or a Best Tech or uh, one of those companies? Or is that kind of a moot point? Um, I've thought about it. I was supposed to work with Riot for a couple projects. Mm-hmm. Um, never really happened. I have a very sour relationship with the Chinese in the, the sense that my dad did Chinese manufacturing for a long time mm. and he was fucked over by them a few times. Uh-huh. And honestly, I've been fucked over by the Chinese a few times. So every time I try to, I kind of get hesitant around the project. Now, like I said, many people have great success with them. Mm. Uh, problem is I've tried to do a pre-order with them and shit without like the MK 16. We did a pre-order for that. Uh, back in the day, that was that we made like I said six or nine customs, but then we went pro- to do production. And I'm taking out pre-orders, and something happened along the way. They took on someone else's bigger project, and they ghosted me. Ah. And I had to do refunds for people. Oh, and that's terrible. That was never fun. Yeah. I had to do 75 refunds that ruined my PayPal credit history, oh, dude. Because I, I go through about 100 transactions a year, which it's a, it's a little bit for PayPal, but the, the, each one's a folder value, so it's a still a value. That was yeah. back then, at least. But they don't for the loans and stuff like that. They don't look at it. They look at ratios, and that messed up my credit history with them for a while. It just put a salty taste in my mouth. And as far as design, 
Uh, there's not really a point. If I was a manual maker or something like that, it would have been more of a reason to do so. Mm-hmm. But if I really wanted to simplify a design and make 200 of them, I can. I, I could always mill my bevels on the CNC and like I could do that. There's no reason to give it to them and then just hurt my market. Yeah. No matter what anyone says, the moment a maker does a project with China, their secondary drops, their market drops. And I don't make a knife a week like most makers do. I make a knife a day, sometimes more, sometimes less. Sometimes I don't make a knife for a single month because I'm doing R&D. Then sometimes I'll make 40 that month. It just – the quantities I could put out or if I would want to, which I never have put out crazy production quantities, at least on the custom folders I have of different products, just doesn't seem the, – the risk versus the reward. I mean, the reward versus the outcome – yeah, it's fat, a lot of money in my pocket at the end of the project mm-hmm. for little labor. But what's the long-term effects of it is, is what I always look at. We were supposed to do a VBM with China for with Ria and me and Rob. Just, I, I wanted to do it. I wanted to pay for it out of pocket. It's a lot of money out of pocket. We started doing pre-orders because I didn't want to do it like last time. Right. And every time I'm about to do it, I'd have to spend the money or just gonna have the full out of pocket. And, and I always go back to the thing like, yo, Rob – do we, we want to do this or let, let's just make it simpler or do it some way and let's just do it ourselves. Or we can make a third as many customs and make the same amount of money, just fly down, whatever. Do we want to really hurt that market? BBMs have a good secondary white herd. Well, that, that, that really is the beauty of having your own means of production right in your right in your own shop. I mean, mm-hmm. you don't you don't have to rely on anyone else. It's nice to know that there are those OEMs out there and they're making incredible work. There are also American OEMs. You know, for those for those who need them, but it doesn't sound like you need it. So, I mean, that's the thing I thought about. It. I'm not just like, yeah, let's go. I well, there were points where I'm like, yeah, I, I'd really like the extra that extra tens of thousands. You get really, it's not quick. It takes half a year, or whatever. But the money comes in within a week. Yeah. Once everything's said and done, I thought about it. It's like, oh, it's easy money. I kind of need the money right now. I want to buy another CNC, and then it's always like, yeah, what's the long term effects of it? Everyone's market always drops. I've never seen that it fix anyone's market. It's always it's I never really seen it do better for the actual custom end of the business. I, I can see that it dilutes the waters, right? I mean mm-hmm. and like I said, I'm in it for forty years at least, so just built a name in America. I'm actually working with another knife maker on an American production company. I'm talking about two to three hundred dollar knives, like actual true production. Wow. Maybe a year out, half a year out. Well, g- give us a call. <laughs> give us a call. What you know when you're ready to announce it? I'd love to. Oh, we're working on. We were supposed to have prototypes for Blade Show. We kind of put it on the back burner a little bit to make yeah. sure our own things are going. But it's going to be automatics. It's not going to be frame oh, locks. Sweet. It's going. I-, I could actually announce it. Me and Matt have ready. Ready. So it's me and Mac Diskin. Oh, okay, cool. So yeah, we're going to be calling it Syndicate Knives or Syndicate Blades. Uh, it's essentially going to be like I said, like Pro Tech level and more like production price points uh, 200 bucks 300 bucks for high end ones maybe less for certain ones and semi-custom versions uh i'm not going to grind any of those blades uh-huh. we will have versions that are hand ground grind by others others but i will be doing all the manufacturing and assembly in-house That's we already awesome, have man. prototypes i'll be announcing but now that I, like because of the virus i've been working my ass off they shut down new york yeah so i was given the approval to still work but I made enough inventory, and thankfully, the community is great, and the clients are great. And I was really stressed out last week while I was finishing up product. But sales haven't really – they've slowed down, definitely. But I'd still say I'm I'm selling about 75% of what I used to a week. Right and I'm extremely grateful for that. And so, like I said, I, I made – right before this happened, I was probably working on my biggest batch of my career. Because I didn't, like I said, sometimes you have a month where you make a lot. Sometimes you don't. Like right. I didn't make a single knife in February. But it translated to the amount of knives they finished in March. Right. And I was like, oh, this is a great time to have a giant inventory, I guess, when the market's <laughs> crashing. Yeah, yeah. You planned that well, man. So, yeah, before we wrap up, I want to ask you about the Bladeology podcast. How long have you been doing that? And tell me a little bit about it and what you get out of it. Uh, well, for me, I, I was never a maker who's very public with my personality. I, I'm a very – I'm not an odd person. I'm an odd person for my generation, I, I'd say. Not very social publicly. Mm-hmm. I, I love to be social in person, but I'm not. I don't really have social media for my personal life. I have one social media for my personal life to get just stay in contact with my friends. I'm not gonna say it, but uh, I just don't like. I like. I'm, I'm old soul. I like to be out in person. Like I, I hate when I'm out with my friends at a dinner table and they're all on their phones. It's just oh not, god, it's yeah. not my not my thing. Like I said, I'm, I'm too. I was about to say 24 because I'm used to saying 24. I'm actually 23. Okay. 
it's just not how I am. And that's why you never really see me talking about myself. I never, I've never really posted pictures of myself on my Instagram. I was like, you know what? Ever since my dad started working with me, my output has gone up three times, actually. Usually, two work, two competent workers actually makes three competent workers hmm. because I can stay busy at what, what I'm better at. He stays busy at what he's better at and actually produces – we fill each other's shortcomings or essentially, he fills in my procrastination. <laughs> things that I don't want to do, he takes care of. Okay. Uh, and at that point, I was like, you know, at the further step into marketing, I have to start talking about myself more, uh, showing who I am, uh, what the business is like, stuff like that. And I approached Jeremiah – He's a friend of mine for a couple of years. He's one of the owners of PVK Vegas. Mm-hmm. I was like, do you want – because he has a media background. I was like, do you want to start a podcast? This is uh, mainly – that was a bunch of podcasts. There wasn't many out there and I wasn't in it for the fame and glory and we don't run it too crazy because I'm busy. I'm a maker and he edits mm-hmm. it when he can when he can, and uh, he does. we don't do the whole Reddit and really marketing it really, really hard because uh, we don't talk about basic EDC stuff every day. Mm-hmm. Mainly, there's three of us. It's me, Jeremiah, and Elijah Isham. So we have three very unique perspectives on the industry: uh, being me, that me, me, him being the dealer, me being the maker, and Elijah being the designer. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't like, like I said, we don't talk about what's going on in the community. At, at, be- at the beginning, we kind of tried, and we also we do a lot of shows. We did 11 shows together last year, and we do them all together. Uh, we tried to talk about the show before and after, but it always kind of became the same old thing. Oh, mm-hmm. Nick's working his ass off; he's not sleeping. Jeremiah's about to go buy a bunch of stuff. Elijah's like, cool, I'll, I'll see you guys there. And the same thing when we got back. It was always kind of the same thing. So we kind of don't really do those anymore. Mainly, we just concentrate on interviewing knife makers. Our episodes are a lot longer than yours. Uh-huh. They're about usually an hour and a half to two hours, sometimes three, depending. Some of the knife makers we have interviewed are 40 years in the business. Yeah. And we all, Jeremiah's more in touch with the old school makers. I'm more in touch with the new school makers. So we kind of try to alternate every other episode. Uh, it's more about recording the history and just yes. getting – and for my benefit, it was recording the history. It kind of gets me out of the shop just to talk at, the, at my house and still kind of consider business and just get my voice out there. People hear me talk more and, and so on. But it's fun. It's yeah. Not, it's not profitable at all, obviously. It actually cost us like $400 last week to set up the website, Zen, Zencast and all that. It's not like we're going to make that money back off of it. It just It's just fun. Yeah, and it's a great way to catalog your career. And and uh, you know, you mentioned um, how you you have three very different perspectives. That makes for an interesting interview because you know the three of you are all with your questions coming at uh, the interviewee from a different perspective. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, and also same thing for me. Like I said, I want to get my like my personality out there, mm-hmm. get people to know me. Same thing for a lot of these makers. Like, if you notice, we, we interviewed a lot of old school makers that some guys don't even, the new guys don't even know who they are. Like, yeah. Reese Weiland, for example, yeah. two weeks ago. That was a four and a half hour episode that we had to break up in two parts. Yeah. And that was after Jeremiah edited a lot of it because he has so much history in this, in, in, in his knife making career that we, he get, we get sued for a lot of it because he talked about things that he's not allowed to. Uh. Just because he's like, I don't give a shit anymore, happened, whatever. I'm like, yeah, we have to edit that out. But he has a really rich history to where I didn't even know that he invented the button lock automatic, for example. Oh, but wow. He did that. Uh, or it was the button. It was the pretty much the button lock he invented. And he, he talks about how he it was the, his biz, biggest regret in life was not patenting that system because he would have made millions by now. Many companies wow. use it. Yeah. So what is the future of NCC knives? Uh, right now, I'm trying to buy another CNC. Mm-hmm. Because uh, I got to, once you get a new employee, it takes a little bit to figure it out. But I'm kind of at that point now to where I'm manufacturing more knives leaving my shop and the machine's actually cutting. So my dad gets dead points where he's like waiting on parts for me. So now the next goal is to get another machine. So that way I could meet up, meet the man, make enough parts to where he's always he's always employed. But there's some times where he, I'm, I pay him to do nothing. Sweep the shop clean because I'm like, I need, like, I'll have 40 sets of handles. But then I don't the machine the blades are still machining, so I'm like right. I need like another day or two before I have blades for these handles for you. And then even then, it's like he'll start assembling not like ten knives with one backspace there. I'm like ah, I need a couple more days before I have backspace oh. for these knives. <laughs> so it's kind of it, the flow isn't perfect. Uh, the, the, I did the math. I need another CNC. Well, I was trying to get one within by blade show essentially with, with the market. Uh, I'm better off stockpiling my savings a little bit, right. see, riding this out, see how the commun- the economy goes before I buy another machine. And then the syndicate thing, that's going to be a big part of my career. 
That's that we're trying to start a production company. It's not a side business. That's, syndicate. That's, I mean, that's that a career. What? Can you give me the full name of that again? Uh, Syndicate Blades. Syndicate Blade. I, I wanted it to be Syndicate Blade Works, but I got overruled. <laughs> that that'll be something. That'll be cool yeah. because because it sounds like you're making it affordable. But obviously, you got two uh, marquee makers attached. I mean, that's not not just attached. Two marquee makers collaborating uh, for affordable knives. I think I think you guys will just knock it out of the park yeah i i have the manufacturing means and uh the will i'm young i work stupid hours as is right what's an extra couple hours over 24 <laughs> and matt has the years of knowledge and experience so it's kind of a perfect match something i was kind of joking around with him about he's like i'm ready i'm like what, what do you mean he's like, oh, i'm ready let's do it I'm like, okay let's figure it out then <laughs> kind of been messing around with it for about three months and I made a prototype. I haven't really showed the prototype yet. It's an MK1 Micro. It's going to oh. be custom, mm-hmm. but it's what I used as the platform to figure out the automatic. And we already have springs made, custom springs, custom buttons. And uh, I'll say it, the springs we've made are better than anyone else. Any other company, we've tested all of them. And Matt spent some mat, did some mat, spent some time developing a better spring. I, I can't wait. Running. I can't wait to check it out. I'm on a... I'm on an automatic tear, even though I can't carry them in my state. I don't care. Same They're thing with me. Jer- Jeremiah introduced that whole life, like, like side of knives to me. I never collected them. Now I actually, the only collection I have now are automatics. God, yeah. I have Microtex, Protex. They're just fun. Yeah. They, they are addicting. I have a, I have a dual action light foot micro, uh, Microtech from 2004 that I got recently. That is so cool. Anyway, oh, nice. please tell everybody, uh, Nick, how they can get in touch with you, how they can follow you and, and, uh, where, how they can actually get their hands on your knives. Uh, so you could find me at NCC knives at Instagram. Uh, my website is active. Unlike most knife makers, I actually keep it up to date and run it except the, the random portions. I, now that I am home, I'm actually going to build a new website, update it a bit. The shop does work. NCC knives at yahoo.com or at gmail.com. Or the contact, the, the best way to contact me, though, is the contact page on my website. Is that if you've ever ordered anything from me or will order anything from me, it links it all together. Well, Nick, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It was great to talk to you and get to know you a little bit and uh, to find out about your knives. And, and really, what an, you know, like an interesting story you have. Uh, you're a young man. You've done so much so far in this uh, in this field we're all obsessed with, or at least most of us. And... Uh, you know, my hat's off to you. I, I can't wait to see what you come up with, and I can't wait to check out uh, Syndicate Blades in the future. Uh, thanks again for coming on. Thank you. I just want to mention one more thing. I forgot. I'll be uh, doing right now, as you mentioned, where to get my knives. I usually do orders only. Once in a while, every couple knives, I do put something for sale. Uh, but I'm going to be doing a pre-order right now on those MK1 micros that I mentioned. Mm-hmm. Kind of Right now that I'm home, trying to figure out all the options and get it going. Nice. Well, you heard of people... Get on that. Uh, you said mini or micro? Micro. So that's the MK1, same knife, but it's two and a half inch long blade. It's a tiny one. Okay, cool. So so get on that pre order now uh, while while uh, while Nick is at home and working that all out. Get on it early and often. <laughs> all right, Nick. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you, Bob and Jim. I really enjoyed it. You guys run a tight ship here. <laughs> thank you, sir. Take care. Have a question or maybe you just have a comment? Give us a call at 724-466-4487. We'll answer your question on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. That number again, 724-466-4487. All right, Bob, Nick Chuprin, New York City knife maker. You can find mm-hmm. him at nccknives.com. I always uh, try to ask you your key takeaway or interesting thought from the interview. To me, as usual, it was very interesting to hear about his process and to hear about how he uh, actually constructed his business and and the different uh, sacrifices he made along the way at a very young age, knowing what he wanted to do. And and I find that all very you know very interesting and leads to these amazing knives. But the thing I keep thinking about is I. I love when people surprise me, and it's very easy for me to lump entire generations worth of people into one category. But I love to hear of someone young in the, you know, kids today. He's a kid today, and he's killing it. He mm-hmm. is, uh, you know, he's got a thriving company. He is really excellent at making knives. He can support the, the folks around him with his business. So an inspirational story all around. And, and, and I love to hear that it's coming from someone so young uh, who... <laughs> 
who, mm-hmm. frankly, it, it's easy to dismiss the young when you get a little bit older and crotchety. And these and young whippersnappers, <laughs> you know, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and and he's just, uh, you know, he's he's yeah. really uh, showing a good face for his generation. Well, and to rebuild his business or his shop, because, you, you know, the, the first shop he built got taken out by Hurricane Sandy. Mm. And I was like, you know, just to have that determination at that age to do it again and to keep going. It's like, wow. Yeah. yeah and once you once you do something like that at an early age, it's kind of like taking care of your exercise in the morning. The rest of the day, you know, you've gotten right. that out of it. Well, he's faced some some big things as a as a small business owner and mm-hmm. he's overcome. Hmm. Exercise in the morning. Maybe that's my problem. <laughs> Or maybe I just don't like exercise. Ah, that's the problem. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that narrows it down. All right. That's going to about wrap it up for the Knife Junkie podcast. But again, a reminder, please join Bob on the Knife Junkies YouTube channel this coming Saturday. That's April 18th at noon, theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. It's going to be a great several-hour Saturday afternoon live knife hangout, and uh, I know I can't wait, and we yeah. can't wait for you to join us. And, and I'm pretty sure you're not going to be going anywhere or doing anything at that point. So you might be doing something, but you can still listen. You can still tune in, right? Absolutely. You're not Absolutely. leaving the house. Not till May, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe even June. Who knows? TheKnifeJunkie.com slash YouTube. Make your plans to join us Saturday, April 18th at noon. And if you want to listen to this podcast, future podcast, past episodes, you can also go to TheKnifeJunkie.com and you'll find all the podcast episodes listed right there. So for Bob, The Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, The Knife Newbie Person. Thank you so much for joining us on The Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for listening to The Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at ReviewThePodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm-hmm.